So the third concept is titled Entry-Level Training Modules. And this is a PAR, and Renee Ryder, Program Director in Genomic Medicine, will give the concept presentation. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be presenting this con oh, mask. I'm really excited to be presenting this concept today, but first I'd like to acknowledge that this was a huge team effort, and I wanted to thank Lucia, Terry, Wynn, and Rob for all working on this with me. This concept really has two main purposes. The first one is to increase genomic knowledge in the workforce of our entry-level genomics workforce. And then secondary to that is that we want to enhance diversity within the field of genomics. So first, when we're talking about this, I think it's important to really define what it is we mean when we're talking about the entry-level research workforce. And what we're talking about is positions that don't require bachelor's degrees, but they often require dedicated training and specific skills that they obtain in community, technical, or tribal colleges. Some examples of the positions that we're talking about are medical assistants, nursing assistants, research assistants, and laboratory assistants. And when we're talking about where they fit into the research workforce, these are the people who are you know, a medical assistant that might be in a clinical research program who's taking a medical history for a patient, but is now in a genomics research program, and we really would like them to also take a family history. Um, or it's the laboratory assistant who's now in a genomics laboratory, and we really would like them to know the genomics terminology of things like somatic versus germline. So those are the, the types of positions that we're talking about. Now, when we're talking about modules, we're not talking about recreating um, whole curriculums for these different types of positions. Instead, what we're talking about is standalone units of curriculum that will supplement existing training programs. So maybe that medical assistant training program is already existing at a community college, but they need to have some genomics information put into their program to help bolster it. Um, there are many types of ways that people can actually make these um, modules, that they could make online coursework, or they could make lesson plans for in-person classes. They could have suggested readings or activities to enforce the lessons. We would encourage people applying for these grants to be completely creative in um, making uh, education available for the, um, the students. And after these are made, they would be made freely available so that other institutions could also use them. And when we're talking about the modules, some example areas are we're looking at topics that could be from basic genomic concepts or genomic research um, testing strategies or methodologies, or maybe topics from ethical, legal, and social aspects of genomic research. When um, we're looking at putting this together, what we'd like to see is a collaboration between lead sites and partner institutions. So the lead site would be the grant institution. They would be the ones with the content expertise in genetics and genomics. They would have a demonstrated capacity for relationships with their identified partner institutions. And they'd be the ones who actually develop the educational modules to be implemented at the partner institutions. They would then provide training on the modules and support the implementation at their partner institutions. We're looking at having three to five lead sites um, be granted. Then the next um, component to this is those partner institutions. By the partner institutions, we're talking about the community colleges, the technical colleges, the com tribal colleges, who are actually the ones that already have those training programs. Um, they're the ones who are training the entry-level research workers, and staff at the partner institutions are going to work with the lead institutions to get training on those modules. And then they're going to be the ones who actually provide the genomics, genomics education to the students. Next, when we look at that second um, purpose for this, our, uh, for this um, concept, is to enhance diversity within the field of genomics. And we really want to do that on two different levels. First, we know that the entry-level workforce is much more diverse when compared to graduate, postdoctoral, senior research positions. And what we would like to do is there is money set aside in our budget 
to enhance diversity at the entry level. So it's um, $100,000 that we would expect each lead site could use to support tuition and education of the students at the partner institutions. And we would expect that this would reduce barriers to entry and increase enrollment in those programs that are actually educating on genomics. And then second to that, we also think that this is gonna enhance diversity throughout the workforce. We know that some of these um, people who are you know, medical assistants, research has shown that they often do switch careers, that they go back, get more education, and switch careers. Many of them become nursing. If we can provide exposure and training in genomics, we might be able to funnel some of those to learning and um, switching careers into the genomic field. So we can attract a more diverse workforce in genomics, not just at the entry level, but at all levels of the workforce. Now funding. We're looking at the first two years of the award, it being a three-year award with the first two years having a little bit more money than the third year. And that's because in the first two years, that's the creation and implementation of the modules. So it's gonna be a little bit more resource intensive. Year three, it's a little bit lower budget, but that's because that's the year that they're going to evaluate and refine the modules. We expect each award to have a total of about $600,000. If we grant three awards, that would be about 1.8 million total costs over three years. I did wanna point out the fact that we have included an 8% indirect. That's because of the mechanism that we're using. The R25 does have the 8% cap on indirects. The funding will be provided to the lead sites, which they can then use subcontracts to support implementation at the partner institutions. We have already been um, talking to NSF and they are very interested in collaborating on this idea. And then we would also like to talk to some ICs for co-sponsoring. I'm now gonna open up the floor for discussion. We have two discussants today, Dr. Brothers and Dr. Cox. Dr. Brothers, would you like to start the conversation? Sure, thank you very much. Um, when, when I first heard about this idea, I was skeptical, I admit. Um, I didn't think about this audience as a group of folks who might be interested in genomics training and, and who, who could help NHGRI uh, achieve its mission. Um, but as I thought more about it, I thought about the medical assistants that I work with. I'm a primary care pediatrician, so I thought about uh, the folks that we work with who ask me what I do, and I tell them, but there's, they don't know anything about that. Um, and then also in, in the uh, clinical research group that I work with, um, many folks with the, this type of background who are doing that, that uh, types of uh, clinical research, often not touching on genomics, but really could build that experience and really help us in the genomic medicine research domain. So um, I think this is, uh, I'm really convinced that this is a, a useful thing to do, a really helpful thing to do. Um, I also uh, really uh, like the framing of uh, looking to this uh, group of students as uh, tomorrow's more advanced genomics research uh, workforce. Um, you know, folks coming uh, from, um, you know, underserved backgrounds often pursue these sort of uh, associate level uh, training programs because they don't, they don't have enough resources to, uh, you know, go for a bachelor's right off the bat. Um, but there's a lot of, um, a lot of skill, a lot of potential in, in those students. And so I think uh, creating opportunities to kind of um, interest uh, these folks in genomics really creates an opportunity to build a more diverse workforce um, th throughout genomics um, all the way up to the doctorate level. So um, yeah, I, I'm a big supporter of this. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Dr. Cox, do you have something you'd like to say? I, I, I I'd add, I'm also a big supporter. I thought this was a very creative way of addressing several of the recommendations that came out of the NHGRI strategic planning activities. And so I, I, I agree. It, I, I mean, it is novel. It's, it's a really different way of thinking about it. But I, I think it hits a lot of buttons and not just in the spaces that I think you originally tried to hit. But I love the way it democratizes genetics within medicine in important ways, and especially to directly to the people 
who have the most contact with patients and who are going to know and care the most about what's best for the patients, what the patients are really getting. So I, I see this as a, as a really useful two-way street in getting feedback from people also who get these education materials um, over time, getting feedback from them on, you know, what, what's really worked with the patients in terms of, you know, further explaining things to people and so forth. I, I, I'm very excited about this initiative, but it did make me think that this, this is another one that would benefit from some thoughtful data collection so that we, we really do track um, as much as we can more, you know, people who might be then as they choose to go into nursing, subspecializing in some aspect of nursing that includes genetics and genomics, maybe in the cancer space or whatever. I, I, I'd love to be able to see how, how the investment from NHGRI may accumulate benefits in the genomic spaces. And I, I know that's going to be hard data to track, but I, I think I think it's really worth making an effort to think about how we might might track some of this information. Thank you. Dr. Jarvik. Thanks, Renee. That was a great presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, I have a comment and then a question. My comment is, I think those of us who have a role in admissions for medical school and graduate school recognize that those programs are more and more valuing people who have post-bachelor, you know, research assistant or um, medical assistant training so that some of those people are planning, actually, to go on and they're in that role. And so that's a great place to expose people to genomics who may go on to do other things with their career. My question is, um, if you could comment a little bit more on the dissemination of the materials that are developed beyond the partnering programs, and then also what do you think the lifespan is? I think this is you know, more basic information, has a longer lifespan, but nonetheless, a lot of things I learned were changed over the years. Um, and so if you could comment on those two things. Absolutely. So as far as dissemination beyond the, the original programs is first, we do expect sharing between the, the lead sites. So the lead sites would share. So automatically it would, you know, just in the lifespan of this grant be, um, you know, what's developed for one set of lead site partner institutions would then go the other ones. Beyond that, we do want to make sure that the, um, they're freely available and that we have not specified an exact manner that they make them freely available. Instead, they would be, that's part of the application that we would judge to make sure that they have a plan. And then, um, I'm sorry, what, your, your second part. Lifespan of the material. The, the lifespan. I think that a lot of this is going to have a very long lifespan, you know, especially when we're talking about things like terminology, how to gather a family history. I do expect that there will need to be updates because, you know, even in my lifespan, the way we draw a pedigree is changing, you know, when we talk about gender inclusivity. So, you know, those types of updates will need to happen, but I suspect that that's going to be a self-motivating um, aspect of this program because the you know, if it's a genetic counseling program that is the one who actually makes these modules, they're going to have assistants who come into them to, um, to help them with their research. So they're going to have that self-interest to updating the modules that they've made. So we expect, you know, there to need to be updates, but it, to be self-motivated. Dr. Craven. Oh, sorry. So I noticed on your list of possible training topics that it didn't include genomic data analysis. And I assume your list is not, not complete, but do you see that as within the scope of what someone might propose? And, and do you think that there's um, part of the audience you're trying to target would be interested in genomic data analysis and have the right background? That's actually um, an interesting topic because it's one we have been discussing. Um, you know. That's not my area of expertise at all. So in my mind, you would need to have a bachelor's degree in order to really contribute to that. Um, but I'm probably wrong about that. So, you know, that's a part where I don't know exactly how the entry level fits into genomic data analysis. But I would hope that um, 
someone who's applying for this, if they have partnerships with people who do, do genomic data analysis, that's an area that they would investigate. Do you want to add to that, Lucia? I'm not really a genomic data science expert either, but some of the ex examples that we were talking about in our small group were you know, a laboratory technician who's working with sequencing data, and that sequencing data goes as an input into something else, and you know, it, or if they're working with um, a, a research project that involves biobank data, that's large scale, and so there could be data science components to that too. So I, I do think it's relevant. I think it, we would see you know, applicants propose that as part of their curricula. I could definitely see that. Okay, I've got Iftikhar, Tim, and then Steve. Go ahead. Uh, I really love this concept, great idea. And I love the co comments by Nancy. I think tracking would be really important. Uh, my question was, most of the budget would be development and dissemination of the material. But you mentioned tuition, and I wasn't clear what that meant. Right. We've actually, um, when we were developing a sample budget, we actually allocated $100,000 per year to support tuition and education of the students. It would be at the lead site's discretion on how they thought to best use that. We would expect them to use it to enhance the diversity of the programs. Um, when we were looking at the cost of of um, tuition for a lot of these programs. They could, there are some certificate programs that are as low as $1,000. They could completely support students, you know, 100 students at that, or they could offset some, just some of the tuition for, um, for a, a more costly program. And one other thing about the activity code we chose, the R25, is it's one of the activity codes that we use in the training program for course development, curriculum development. And that activity code does include um, costs for evaluation. It includes costs for tuition and education. And so like a lot of these things are built into the way that these RFAs are actually written. Uh, Renee wanted to focus at a pretty high level in terms of the concept, but we do have the ability to, um, to write very clearly what we expect applicants to do with respect to those costs. So, the, so, so there could be a certificate um, that the person could obtain and the tuition would be paid as part of the budget? Is that what you were saying? Yes, absolutely. A lot, we would, well, we would expect that, um, you know, if it's a medical assistant program that already grants a certificate, that's the certificate that they're working for. We're not adding a new certificate. Um, so there are existing certificates that they would be going for and they could get tuition offset so that th that could help them get that certificate, yes. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I love this. I'm, I'm, I'm highly supportive. I was, you mentioned that all the funding would go to the LEAD Institute and then get disseminated out through subcontract. Is that, is that um, the only way to do that or are there other potential mechanisms of distributing the funds that you considered? I'm new, so I, that's the only one I know about. <laughs> so I, I think the, the unit here is talking about the development of the curriculum, and I think it's an interesting concept to figure out who would be sort of responsible for developing that curriculum. I think as we sort of initiated this idea, the idea would be at least start with the people who could develop the content um, to sort of you know build on what they've already done. But I think what's new here is really the partnerships with the tribal colleges, community colleges, institutions which traditionally haven't gotten NIH funding. And so if we could make sure that the institutes that developed the curriculum did have good partnerships, that's how we sort of viewed the contribution. Um, are there other ways that you would think about structuring it? No, I mean, I guess what I'm worried about is the partner institutions feeling that they're playing a second fiddle kind of role in that sort of reinforcing um, some sort of power structures that you don't really want to reinforce. But I don't know if there's an alternative mechanism that actually is possible. That's why I'm asking. Right. And that's why I think as part of when we write it, we really want to encourage them to make it a partnership from the very, very beginning. So when they're looking at creating curriculum, it's not we want a lead institution to create curriculum and then give it to people. We want them actually to do a needs analysis to figure out what it is that the partner institutions need and and to fit those needs. So we really want to encourage it to be a true partnership. 
And I think Rob has. Well, we did, we did, when we talked to NSF, we actually, there was a representative from the community colleges, and the challenge with them is they don't have the infrastructure to get the grants and support the grants. You know, we know there's an expense there. And so that's one of the things that they said that would be very difficult for them to do. Um, and so that was really our rationale for that. And they thought it was actually very, I mean, we respected that impression that we could give, but they weren't to the point that they could actually accept a grant directly. So it was a low-cost way, low cost way of getting it to them. Thank you. Steve. Yeah, I'm very supportive of this. I, I, it would be nice to, to uh, somehow fold what is being produced by this initiative in with the existing healthcare provider genomics education resources page at NHGRI, which is a lot of great information, and maybe even having a welcome for every module by Eric Green, you know, that he can then put on his Twitter feed to get that distributed so it gets even greater uh, audience. But, you know, I, I do think that it's something that, that is, is really focused on an important area and, and a population that is really uh, critical for developing this type of support infrastructure. Well, and thank you. And now when we ask Dr. Green to do stuff for us, we can say, but council said. Yeah, Steve said. <laughs> you got 10,000 I wanted that button, Rudy, where we could cut the mic off. Right. Steve, by, by, by folding in, you mean that we should use that vehicle to get anything that's developed out, yeah. which would be yeah. easy to do. Yeah, agree. Hal Dietz. Okay, um, I too am very excited about um, this program. Uh, I think it's likely to be very impactful um, during the years that the, the uh, materials are being uh, created and actively disseminated. But getting back to Gail's question about um, the lifespan of uh, these materials, I would worry that even if they are disseminated, um, that someone's uh, engagement with the materials would become more casual over time. Um, the materials would uh, lose their, um, you know, uh, timeliness. Um, you know, they'd become obsolete in some way, um, and uh, I, I, it would dilute um, the impact um, of the program over time. So I'm wondering, is there thought about making this a uh, permanent online learning vehicle um, that would need to be updated um, and that there would be some assurance um, that a, a, par a participant um, views the entire program, for example, and uh, exhibits their competency uh, by some online test um, and then gets appropriate recognition um, like a certificate um, that could add to their um, motivation in completing the program and career development after completing the program. I would just hate to see the impact dwindle over time. That is a, a concern that we have talked about in our team. Um, and that's also, you know, the, the idea of creating a certificate program is, is another idea that we talked about in our team. But what we really realized is that by focusing on such a, a broad, diverse um, set of entry-level positions, it would be hard to create a single certificate program because the needs in a laboratory might be different than the needs of a, a medical assistant. So we really wanted to make these modules kind of a pick and choose so that if a, a specific MA program thought that for their students, modules one, three, and five were important, but for the laboratory assistant program, they really thought modules four and five were important, that they could put what was appropriate for their students. Um, and that's something that we really valued and wanted to stick with, which is why we really can't create an independent certificate program. Um, so, so, so we are definitely thinking about the, con the, the concerns you brought up, and we're trying to balance that with other needs. Um, I think Wynne wanted to add one more thing to that. One of the other reasons why we wanted to target this population is because there's going to be a projected um, increase in terms of the occupational workforce. 
So there's a projected 16% increase um, just for medical assistance alone. And so these programs um, are very competitive. There are over 1,200, just, just again, just speaking in the medical assistant workforce. And so if you put out into the space that, well, these programs have genomic modules and you, they're going to make your graduates more competitive for the jobs that are out there, you can imagine that the competitive nature of these programs is going to increase the interest in this and also um, foster more interest in creating more information. Say, well, we have the most up-to-date. And so, again, it's, it's the same type of uh, self-motivated um, self-interest, unfortunately, for these programs, but great for the, the students who would be interested in it. The idea, too, is that if we have, um, you know, when a, a person hires a doctor, if their students are coming from a certain program without good information, they're not going to keep getting hired. So I think that's part of the feedback cycle that we're looking at on this program. Howard? Uh, thank you for that presentation. Uh, I too am very supportive of this program. I think there's a lot of opportunity here to really engage in a segment of the uh, the workforce that we have not before. My question is about whether this program is envisioned only for our students who are in a full-time training, or is it going to be compatible with somebody who is still holding down a job and continuing to um, do this kind of enrichment? I think that's going to be very important to really have a broad access to this opportunity. I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I, I go to school at night, so I really agree with that point. Um, so this, I think, can be incorporated into any program. They, there are a lot of programs out there that are meant to be done part-time. These modules can be put into those programs. They can also be put into the full-time programs. As a genetic counselor, I often had, um, we hired genetic counseling assistants who needed training. These are modules that as a hiring person, I could put into my clinic and actually you know, tell them, hey, can you please do the module on family history? So we really view this as being very flexible in where it could be implemented. Additional questions or comments? Okay, can I get a motion to approve the concept? Second, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Anyone wish to abstain? Great, thank you very much, Renee. Thank you.